Just a little bit on this decking at the dam project. If you saw in a previous video, I was talking about how we wanted to stain and do up this little decking area that's near our dam. And we were really thrilled to be able to find some stain left over from, some pre from the previous owners in one of the back sheds. So my husband set to scrubbing off the wood, cleaning it all, and then he started staining it. But this is as far as he got because we ran out of stain. It's very easy with something like wood stain to think that you will have enough, but you kind of forget how thirsty that wood is. It just really drinks in the stain. So this, I guess, worked out okay at this stage because the bench seat that I have ordered to go onto the deck once it's all finished and stained, um, the order was seriously delayed and then the company said that they had delivered it but I had not received it so now they've had to send out another seat. So we're waiting on the seat anyway and in the meantime we have bought a tin of stain. It's a little bit disappointing because it makes the budget for this project a little bit higher than I had wanted it to be but at the same time at least now we can get it finished and hopefully we will have some stain left over from that tin to use on another project. I wonder if any of you out there still write letters. I know that at least a few of you do because I've had some really lovely letters and cards sent to me from all over the world. But I don't think it's such a common thing for people to write letters anymore, is it? And I'm certainly guilty of this myself. I would much rather shoot off a quick email to somebody, maybe even make a really fast phone call, than to sit down and actually write a letter. But I have had people over the years that I've written to frequently. Some of them have passed on already, one person that I do make time to write to is my grandmother who is 95 and that's who I'm writing to today. I've found it difficult to find really nice writing paper. You know when I was little and we had things like pen friends and no computers or emails. There were so many beautiful writing paper sets to be found. They were often scented and it was kind of exciting every time you got a letter or sent a letter because you could really personalize it with some beautiful paper. But that's not really the case anymore. So what I do is I make my own writing sheets of paper. I use a simple image like the one you can see on this piece of paper from Creative Market and I'll leave a link to them down below. That's just a way that you can get some really beautiful images like this really pretty watercolor floral print here. And I can just isolate that image, put it on a piece of paper along with some basic lines like you can see here because I need all the lines I can get to keep my writing as neat as possible. And then I can just use that over and over. I can print it out as many times as I want to or I can use another image to make another type of paper. I do think that I need some practice with my handwriting because I'm so used to typing these days that my hand gets all cramped and sore every time I write a letter and my writing is certainly not as neat as it used to be. I'm sending some photos to my grandmother as well that we had at Christmas time when all of our family was together. One tip that I have, when, especially when you're writing to an elderly person and sending photos, is to make sure you write on the back of the photo who's who, do it row by row if necessary, say left to right, whatever it is, so that the person, they may not remember every face or, you know, your children grow and people don't recognize them as much and so that's a really handy thing to write on the back and to write the date as well when it was taken. Do you remember this warp? From quite a few videos back now, I was actually making this warp at the warping board and just making the warp took a really 
long time because we're talking over a thousand ends here and as you can see it spans right across the loom and I'd like to say that it's going brilliantly well but that wouldn't be quite the truth I actually feel at this point like I've been doing this since the dawn of time but not in a good way it's just taking a really really long time to get the warp on and that's actually my fault because um, for this half of the warp I put ties in for the rattle cross and for this half of the warp I didn't why I don't know I obviously wasn't very focused on what I was doing at that time and I just missed those ties so um, I actually have a lot of students messaging me with this problem saying oh no I forgot to do my ties in the cross and I encourage them to go forward with the warp because you can work it all out it doesn't come down to how perfect your ties are on your crosses if you don't know what the ties on the crosses are for they are you you make crosses in your warp while you're making it on the warping board and it helps to keep the threads in order because instead of just winding one gigantic loop of warp over and over you're separating threads so that they end up in a cross and if you're doing it for a rattle cross then you can bunch them into groups of how many groups you want in each dent of your heddle that's another silly thing that I did I'll tell you that about that in a minute but um, so the crosses help you a lot when it comes to placing them in your rattle and then actually threading your loom and they they keep the threads in order so that ideally from one side of the loom to the other you are working with one thread at a time exactly as they're laid out on the back warp beam that's in an ideal world so another thing that I did wrong just because I wasn't thinking about it enough was um, and also because I'm not used to this loom yet this is literally my second warp on this loom and I've been using my Louette David loom which has a 10 dent reed and I've been using that for so many years as my only floor loom now on this loom the countermarch loom it has a 12 dent reed so that is why I did my rattle cross groupings in groups of 10 um, so what I should have done was groups of 12 instead of groups of 10 the reason for that being that I'm going to weave at a set of 24 ends per inch in a 12 dent reed so if I put 12 threads in every dent of my rattle my rattle is in half inch increments so then that will end up as 24 threads for every inch if you measured out an inch in this rattle you would find it's 24 threads so again that's another thing that I had to kind of adapt to is not having counted my rattle numbers properly and then not preserving the crosses on some of the warps but um, that has meant that I've had to move the threads around a lot more to get the numbers right and then that means that if you're moving the threads around then you're interrupting that order that is supposed to be there from preserving the crosses and by having the correct number of threads in those crosses as well so a bit of a double whammy from me there but I'm working it out and I encourage you as well as I always say to my students when they email me in a tizzy because they haven't gotten their numbers correct or because they forgot to tie their cross I would say try going forward you can work it out on the loom um, some things might not work out just as you had hoped they would or as you wanted them to but you can still get a serviceable warp on the loom that you can weave with and that's what I'm doing right here so why it's taking me so long is because my threads aren't in order properly I'm getting a lot of tangling and I'm and I'm also experimenting with something else and that is well my husband made me a rattle for this loom 
The loom has a sectional beam, but I don't have all the equipment needed to go with a sectional beam, like tensioning box equipment, etc. And so I really don't want to buy the tensioning stuff if I don't need to because it's so expensive and not all that easy to come by here in Australia. So I'm, I'm trying to do a bit of a um, yank and crank warp here. If you don't know what that is, it's using a roll of paper and you will have seen me talk about this paper in other videos as well. But if you haven't, I'll link to those videos and I'll link to the paper down below. And you have the roll of paper going and you, it's literally like it sounds. You yank all of the warp into place and the paper helps to get the tension and hold the tension. And then you turn the warp just a little bit, that's the cranking part, and then you come back and you yank it all again. So the idea is that the warp takes up the slack and tensions because you're just doing little by little. But um, I have a really long warp here, so it's really taking me a long time. But you know, this project has taken a long time in pretty much every stage that it's been at, even in the planning stage. And I still, I still have not even decided whether I'm doing a twill or a plain weave. I just don't know. Um, I can't make up my mind about it, but I'll probably make up my mind once I start adding the heddles onto the shafts and um, seeing how many heddles I have to do on one and two if I do plain weave, then I might like the variation of adding heddles to the other shafts. Or I might be so over it at that point that I just think, oh, I just want to do a simple plain weave so that I don't have to worry about tying up more treadles and all of that. Uh, I don't know. I'll have to see when I come to that. Well, I say pa patience is a virtue and weaving definitely teaches you a lot of patience. There aren't many areas that are actually fast, but you know, I do intend to try out my fly shuttle race once I finally have this warp all done and threaded and ready to go. And hopefully that will mean that the weaving part of this project will be super fast. But for now, I've got to keep yanking and cranking. So I've finger combed all the tangles out to a certain point. And I also have to hop in and out of the loom without cracking my head on something, which is a bit of a challenge. And then I come around to the side and I just move a little ways. Let's say um, a half or almost a full rotation. And then it's a matter of coming back in again without cracking my head on something and yanking. So tensioning up those threads and then finger combing them through again if they need it. They don't need it so much at the moment because I didn't do much of a rotation. On the next rotation, I will need to finger comb those threads out a bit more again because they're starting to tangle up. And then towards the end of the warps, let me just grab this to show you. On the other end of these warps, I did thankfully preserve my threading crosses. And so I will be putting the sticks in there once I have the warp more rolled on. And as far as the yank and crank goes, for such a long warp and such a wide warp, um, I'm either going to live to regret it or I'm going to proclaim it as a great discovery. Hopefully the latter. And another thing I need to do at this point is to insert some more paper because my paper rolls have finished. I'm using a couple of paper rolls because I don't have any paper that's wide enough to go right across this warp beam. So I'll be adding them in now because they are essential for the yank and crank to be effective. I 
actually bought this paint by numbers canvas for one of my daughters because she'd been doing diamond painting and she really enjoyed that and so I thought I think she'd be interested in having a go at paint by numbers. I know that I as a teenager really enjoyed doing these but I sort of underestimated how difficult this one was going to be. It's a very large canvas and the sections for painting in are just super small like it's challenging for me and I've had to buy some particular paintbrushes that would actually fit the spaces as well because the paintbrushes that come with the in the kits are really not very good quality at all. So I've been working at this little by little and although it looks like I haven't done very much this is actually hours of work and I like to do this you know sometimes in an afternoon or in the evening when I'm a little bit too tired to maybe do some sort of fiber project but I want to do something creative that I don't have to think about too much and this kind of thing is perfect because all of the spaces are numbered and every paint color has that number on it and so it's really just applying the paint and doing it as carefully as possible but you know if you're not that if you go outside the lines a little bit it's not really a big deal so I'm looking forward to seeing this come to life a little bit more some people might think that paint by numbers and those kind of projects are sort of cheap projects but I just think it's being creative in a fun sort of way and maybe for someone who isn't very who thinks that they're not artistic at all this would be the perfect project as I said for me I don't have to think about it too much and I just enjoy the time quietly sitting down sometimes I listen to a podcast or have a YouTube video going at the same time while I'm painting other times I just enjoy the quiet and peace I'll continue to share this painting as I go along but please don't hold your breath because it may take me quite some time to finish this one Often I will be seized with an idea and it's usually at night time when it happens when I can't do all that much about it when I'm already in bed or you know it's late in the evening and I'm not going to come out to the studio and start working late in the evening but what I usually do when I have a new idea is I'll write it down in my notebook to start with and this is my working notebook where I write all kinds of things, um, ideas, things that I need to do the next day, just anything that I don't want to forget because I, I am quite forgetful. And often if I'm seized with one of these ideas at night, if it's not written down, I will often have completely forgotten it the next day. So I'll write it down and I might even start working towards the idea in the form of perhaps writing out some measurements perhaps um, playing around in my weaving software and making up a weaving draft and then thinking about it a little bit to see whether it's a viable idea. But something that I do have to do every time I get a new idea, if I'm going to go ahead with it, is I have to see it on the loom before I can realize whether it's gonna be a good idea or not such a good idea. Now thankfully most things do work out to be pretty good ideas and they'll work out well but I'm such a visual person I just really need to see it. I can do you know as many mock-ups in my weaving software whatever it is I can write down as many measurements as I want but I absolutely have to see this thing on the loom to know whether it's going to work properly, to, I guess, to really understand it. That's, that's the real point, to understand it. So it's part of the learning process for me as well, to go, okay, it's well enough to have an idea, 
but to follow through with your idea and to see if it's going to work the way that I hoped it would. And so this is what I'm doing right now. I had this idea last night and usually when I'm seized with the idea, I have this incredible amount of enthusiasm for the idea. Like I really do want to get started on it straight away. And I find that if I don't start on it within a certain amount of time, the time varies, then my enthusiasm for the project will wane. And that's always a shame if that happens. And so here I am, the first chance that I got, and I did have a lot to do this morning, so I had to wait a little bit longer than I would like to wait. But I do have a lot of enthusiasm for this project right now. And if it works out well, then it will be my next Etsy project. I'm not going to reveal anything because it may not work out. And I don't want people asking me about when it's going to be released, when um, I decide that I don't like it or it doesn't work as well as I wanted it to. So that remains to be seen as to whether it becomes a future Etsy pattern or not. But this is an essential part of it for me is to, especially when I'm going to be selling a pattern, is I need to know the ins and outs and also testing it like this and seeing if it works. It teaches me so much about the project and about the process that I can then use that really valuable information to teach to whoever buys the pattern. So this is why we sample because the picture that I had in my head does not match what I've got here um, for several reasons. Just design aspects that, you know, um, I thought would be slightly different, like the scale of the design. I wanted it to be smaller, but I can see now, you know, that I've got something to work with here. I can reduce the scale. I can work on that. I also don't really love the colors that I chose so I can see different things that I might be able to do with the colors to change that as well. So this here proves exactly what I was saying before about having to see something, having to actually do it on the loom to understand it better. And this is just the perfect example because it does not look like what I thought it would. 